And now we're going to hear another definition of the cloud, I think. Uh, Batman 3 Warrior uh, is going to talk to us. She is not only the CTO of Cisco, but also in charge of the enterprise group, which is, it seems to me, everything at Cisco. So uh, quite impressive. Uh, yeah, Padma, it's your. to be here today. Actually, I'm not going to give you another definition of cloud. Um, I want to step back and talk a little bit about what is changing in the technology landscape and how it will impact us all in the industry, all the way from applications to devices to infrastructure and changes in business models, et cetera. So it's a little bit broader. I will talk a little bit about cloud as a uh, particular shift in architecture that will drive uh, this future for us. Uh, so my topic today is to share with you a perspective uh, around the future of what I call the connected digital life. Right? So if you kind of think about that, and you, one of the things that I strongly believe in is we're at a cusp an inflection point where the value in economy is shifting from having pure information to what we do with that information. Um, so that shift is something that I call the networked economy. Uh, I think this really became evident as we went through the recent uh, financial crisis. One of the things that it was pretty obvious to us is all our economies are connected, and technology actually can play a role in how this transition happens. And I think that's important as we think about business models, creating new applications and new kinds of technologies, focusing around where will the value be captured as we go through the next de decade in this transition. Uh, along that, you know, if you kind of take that uh, as a notion and a context, then we can think about how might the future of work be different? How will enterprises be structured differently in the future? So it's actually as much a conversation about cultural change as it is a conversation about technology change. I think Mark talked about how technology will be consumed, how it will be delivered differently, but it also means as organizations we have to prepare ourselves to be structured differently as well. Um, I'll next talk about what we at Cisco refer to as the next internet. Cisco, as you know, played a primary role in building the infrastructure for the first internet, and we believe we're at a profound transition where some of the changes that are going on in the types of devices and the types of applications we use actually puts um, uh, an imperative on us to be thinking about innovation in the infrastructure and delivering things in a very different way. Um, and in that context, I'll, t I'll talk about cloud computing being an inflection point. So let me begin with uh, information economy and sort of maybe just describe to you what I mean by information economy. If you kind of think back to the last decade, a lot of value was aggregated to companies that generated information and enabled access to that information. And we benefited as a company from this. A lot of you probably who've been in the industry long enough kind of saw this transition. We are now at a, at a point where perhaps there's too much information, and there's a lot of articles. Actually, economists recently had a focus around data deluge and an overload of information, and people feeling like they're burdened by getting access to a lot of data. And there's a shift now to focusing around the value that can be created around that. And that's something that we call networked economy. And I think this is an important transition, because oftentimes companies are faced with the challenge where there is a lot of competitive pressure, and the value that we created in the past is no longer valuable going forward, and we have to think about new sources of value and how we create that value. Uh, so what are the distinctions between what I call the information economy and what I call the networked economy? So in the past, wealth was created through data processing. I think many of the companies that uh, Mark put up a list here or created and enabled us through technology to have access not just to data, but to process that data. Going forward, wealth will be created to those companies that actually can provide context and relevance to that data. So what, what am I looking for? What can I do with that data? And help me, help me maneuver through this jungle of information that all of us, all of us create. Uh, the second thing is it's no longer just about access to information but it's access to expertise. So this is where I think social networking in the consumer space has really taught us a lot. It's actually connecting with people that have similar interests, uh, similar conversations that are happening. I'm a big user of Twitter, and you know, one of the reasons I use it is it allows me to connect to people that think alike and you know, actually sometimes think differently, but to source that um, access, right? So we think of it in the enterprise context. We have to use concepts like this to provide access to expertise, no matter where that expertise resides, whether it's in the enterprise or outside. 
in the past, we were comfortable as companies and, and, and businesses, including startups, focusing on a particular business model. We sell products or we sell services or we sold applications. The future is really going to be about the ability to manipulate and adjust in different kinds of business models. You know, what the same kind of solution we offer in a developed market perhaps has to have a very different business model when we think of an emerging market. Um, and you know, the, the source of value there is going to be very different. And there's a lot that's been written about co-creation and innovating for the bottom of the pyramid, et cetera. But that actually asks us all in the industry and as innovators to be thinking through how you can pr provide the capability in a company to create and innovate new business models as well. Uh, individuals was the focus in the past. More and more in the future, it's going to be about communities and relationships. Um, if you think one of the things that we do at Cisco is our company is organized essentially as a massive social network. Um, we have groups that come together and drive initiatives. So in my, in my day job, I'm the CTO, and I'm the general manager for our enterprise, commercial, and small business. It's a mouthful. Basically, it means I direct all the products and uh, have responsibility for the products that we do in our core business. But I also participate in things that are emerging, like cloud computing, and drive our strategy. Uh, so more and more we need leaders and we need experts in organizations to be able to play multiple roles and move around in the organization. So this is an experiment, if you will, that we are conducting at Cisco, but we believe this is going to be the nature how companies will be organized in future around this concept of experts coming together. And lastly, um, the focus used to be one or the other. Companies prided themselves on being good at innovation or operational excellence. More and more going forward, we will have to do both. We have to innovate and we have to figure out how to oper operationalize that innovation, which is a dilemma that most companies have and most people have, right? You know, people that are great innovators are often bored by process and the discipline that's necessary to scale that innovation. However, if you're not able to have the discipline, you're a company with many ideas and perhaps very little value that you can create. So this is something I actually think there'll be innovation that will drive this combination of how do you create and how do you scale. Uh, so if you kind of think of that's where the economy or economic value is going to shift, now let's think a little bit about how might the future of work change, right? You know, one of the things that we strongly believe in, intercompany collaboration is going to be very key. More and more, we have to provide the ability for people and organizations to be able to connect with partners, with suppliers, for customers, and cross the boundaries. And the notion of a firewall is going to go away. And we have to be thinking differently about how do you enable security policy in this world where boundaries blur for organizations. This kind of, if you think back about a decade ago, was started in the manufacturing segment, where the manufacturing vertical focused on optimizing their supply chain by including their suppliers in the process. More and more, this is becoming pre prevalent across all different verticals and all different enterprises. Mark talked about the mobile experience, right? You know, one of the things that I often say is we no longer go to work, we simply do work. Um, when I started in the industry, it used to be that you got in your car and went to your office, and that's where you did work. And when you left your office, you left your work. Um, and you can argue whether this is good or bad, but we work all the time, anytime, anywhere we want, right? Um, so then people ask me, so is this going to cause us to be socially inept and not have a life, perhaps? But I think the point is that it, it's actually putting the power of uh, deciding that in your hands. You decide when to work, how to work, and you deliver results. So this is a very big shift. And it's a big shift for companies to be thinking about new kinds of uh, enablement that we have to provide as new kinds of people enter our workforce. I talked about clusters of experts. How do we provide the tools and capabilities with real-time collaboration for people to identify the expertise? So Cisco, for example, is a company with 60,000 employees worldwide, about 40 billion or so in revenue. One of the challenges we have is how do we know where expertise resides, even within our own organization? Because somebody may be an expert at an, an, an area that is perhaps different from what their regular role is in the organization. So we are creating expert tags 
being and enabling people to identify themselves as experts and providing ways and means to, for those groups of experts to come together. So a very different concept where perhaps assignments are now self-selected by the people as opposed to be given top down. So it totally liberates the organization from the traditional box structure that we've had. And lastly, the emergence of millennials, so Generation Y and Generation M, entering into the workforce. So people born in the 80s to 90s, uh, Generation Y and Generation M are people born after the 1990s. So this generation has grown up with real-time, media-rich, mobile experience, and they come to the enterprise and they want to have that same level of capability within the workforce, right? So which means we have to now structure reward systems along with the technology in a very different way. Now let's talk about how the connected life changes with this. Uh, it's very similar, you know, mobile experience is going to be very key. It's going to be pervasive. The other thing we strongly believe is video is going to play a much more significant role than it has, than it has in the past um, as we go in, in the future. And this is a big bet we are making at Cisco. Um, video, if you think of it, is just starting. You know, YouTube kind of created the revolution of on, on um, real-time video. But now if you think about things like telepresence, where you can immersively communicate and collaborate on a mobile device, on any device, it's going to change healthcare to be very different. It's going to change education to be very different. How lessons are delivered, how they're consumed. We're seeing that evolution starting in the business environment in a B2B space, but more and more this will extend across all industries. And this is something that's going to be very profound change for all of us. Next, of course, is the evolution in computing. So this is uh, my one geeky chart, and Mark touched briefly. If you think of the compute architecture and how it has evolved, we've come from mainframes, uh, computer to mini computers, and then we've moved from mini computers to client-server model, and more recently to the web. And what is emerging as a disruption is virtualization, the ability to abstract applications and services away from the infrastructure, which is really the foundation of cloud computing, being able to deliver applications and services in a very um, creative way, very quick way. And I give Amazon a lot of credit uh, because they were a pioneer in this space coming up with this notion of being very flexible and very quick with the way applications are, uh, can be consumed and can be created. And Werner sitting there smiling. But the challenge in reality that most enterprises have is how do they go from the old model to the new model? Uh, how do enterprises evolve from where they are to this new model? And what is the right time to make that evolution? So intellectually, people know. And when I talk to customers, everyone in the industry knows this is the future. Uh, but at the same time, there's a pragmatic challenge of what is the evolution path and how do I go from here to the future? Um, so in the context of everything I said, how will the internet be shaped in the future? And I'm using the internet both as the network and the, and the web and the applications in this context. If you think about the last decade for the internet, uh, what would you say was the killer app on the internet till this point? Email. Absolutely, email was a killer app. It was primarily a messaging platform. Um, we uh, had applications that were tied to the infrastructure. It was vertically integrated. And price performance ratio was what we in the industry optimized. It was MIPS and megabits per second. How fast can you process information and how much information can you process? We worried very little about sustainability, power consumption, cooling requirements, etc. And uh, there was a monolithic way these applications got implemented. Going forward, this is changing fundamentally, and this is a very important point because the network wasn't built for this future internet, and we have to make changes. Going forward, it's no longer about data transport. It's about consuming media, and media not just asynchronous media, but synchronous media, real-time video, right? Which means latency is going to be important. In addition to quality of service, quality of experience is going to be important. So we have to make the network be much more resilient to delivering media-rich, high-bandwidth kinds of applications. At the same time, though, there will be many sensors everywhere. If you think about smart cities or smart grid, how the energy industry might change in the future, that's all about small bandwidth data, but very rapid influxion of data. So you actually have to have the network be able to support both kinds of data handling, very rich, very bandwidth 
restrictive li data like video, like music, etc., and then small bursts of data delivered by multiple sensors or the Internet of Things. So we have to deal with this complexity uh, that's going to come at us. The second big transition is going from a messaging platform to a collaboration platform. As you collaborate and connect with multiple people, how can we enable that in a secure fashion? Uh, especially in the context of an enterprise. Third is sustainability is, is front and center for most CIOs today. Uh, you know, as I interface with them, it's no longer just performance. Performance continues to be important, but they also worry about CO2 emissions, uh, power consumption, cooling water requirements. So we have to create various ways to deliver very sustainable technology. And lastly, this notion of abstracting and creating virtualized applications and services. So that's going to be the future in the internet. And so in, the, in that context of the changes that are going on, why cloud and why now? You know, it's, it's actually to support some of these changes. Uh, it is an imperative that most people feel this transition is going to help. Uh, Mark showed data in CO2 emissions improvement. I've got some data that I'll show you in Cisco's implementation, how it actually drives speed of deployment of services at a lower cost and becoming much more energy efficient as well. So that's the imperative for what is driving the adoption to cloud computing. And so most of the customers that I talk to accept this adoption and move to this adoption because of the need actually for agility and application creation as opposed to cost reduction. So in the beginning when cloud computing was talked about, people thought it was primarily because it was going to be a lower cost way to deploy infrastructure and create applications. It turns out, although that's important, it's actually the speed and agility that are the primary drivers for the adoption for cloud computing. So what are the barriers? You know, there are significant barriers to the adoption and Probably one of the most important barriers that people feel is security and reliability. Uh, what kinds of data should I move? And where do I have, uh, how do I know if my data is not in a data center that I don't control that it's going to be secure? How do I know in a multi-tenant environment that I can have reliability and I can have availability when I need it? So those are the types of concerns that we have to still solve as an industry working together. So this is data in Cisco's implementation of cloud. So Cisco is a large enterprise, as I said. So one of the things we said is, if we believe in this transition, we should implement this in our own, orga own organization. So we have a Cisco cloud that delivers applications within the enterprise. And you can see the uh, transition that we are making, both from a cost point of view, but also in the ability for our own IT organization to deliver applications in a quicker way. So it's a multi-tenant cloud, but the multi-tenancy is still in, in restricted in what we call a private cloud. So it is dedicated to Cisco. The next thing we're doing is actually extending this to our SaaS solutions. We have a software as a service offering called Web a conferring solution that's delivered from a hosted model. Uh, so combining the two expertise, we actually have a lot of learning that we share with our customers in a pragmatic way of how they might evolve. So as I close my session, I want to share with you um, some transitions that we as, in, as, as human beings have gone through. So I want to take you back about 2,000 years to where the Roman aqueducts were created. I'm an engineer, but if I think of perhaps the best example of a networked infrastructure that has sustained itself, this one comes to mind. So going forward about 400 years then to the Taj Mahal, probably one of the best examples of a global infrastructure that has sustained its value, right? It has components that were in, in, uh, included uh, obviously, it's in India, but there are components in the architecture that are very global from the Ottoman Empire, from Europe, etc. And this is an architectural example that has sustained itself. Moving forward, after that, the Panama Canal, perhaps one of the most amazing engineering uh, feats for scalability, actually transitioned and transformed the shipping industry quite substantially. And more recently, uh, the Beijing Olympics and what they were able to create, which is a combination of engineering and, and design expertise. 
I think we as an industry now have, a, uh, have an opportunity to create an architecture, a digital infrastructure in a cyberspace that is very resilient and it's scalable, and that's a challenge that we have. How do you scale this on a global, global basis, enable collaborations, as I talked about? And it's something that we at Cisco look very much forward to working with everyone in the industry to drive through this transition for the next decade. Thank you.